Okay, so it's right up under here. Okay. Okay? You know what I mean? Yeah. Right up under there. So then we don't have to come out with anything yep, in our hands. Yeah. Pull it out, put it there. Yep.
Good morning. If everyone can take their seats so we can get started. Good morning. Good morning. I know it's early, and perhaps you weren't aware I was speaking to you, so why don't we try this? I'm going to greet you all, and when you recognize yourself in my greeting, I want you to actually stand up and say good morning back to me. Can we try that? So, good morning, strong women. Good morning, leading women. Good morning, determined women. Good morning, progressive women. Good morning, resilient women. Good morning, fearless women. Let's not be remiss in welcoming our men. Good morning, supporting men. Good morning, learning men. Good morning, caring men. Good morning, progressive men. It is International Women's Day, y'all. And people all around the world are gathering around to promote gender equity. So good morning, international activist women. My name is Rachel Dawson. I'm the Managing Director of Precision Health at the University of Michigan and a member of the Women of Color Task Force. I like to think of myself as every woman. Are there any other every women in the audience? Good morning, every women. Good morning. Thank you. Please take your seats. We are so thrilled to be here today as we celebrate this special occasion. 37 years of supporting staff development at the University of Michigan. And so on behalf of the Women of Color Task Force and the staff at the Center for the Education of Women, it is our privilege to welcome you to this 37th Annual Career Conference. This year's conference theme is Amplifying Voices Moving from Diversity to Inclusion. One of several definitions of Amplify is to make something more intense. And that's what this conference is about today. It's about more. <laughs> it is a celebration of the persistence and perseverance of the Women of Color Task Force, but so much more. It is the collective acknowledgement by the University of Michigan community that diversion diversity and inclusion matter, and we must continue to weave its virtues within the fabric of our workplaces, our communities, and our homes. That we must be intentional in our promotion, support, deve and development of women, and that while we have made great strides, the race is not finished, the fight is not over. So today, we welcome you to more more opportunity to engage in self-exploration, to take the next steps in your professional and personal life, more time to learn about your finances and wellness, more chances to expand your network of support that you may be encouraged and inspired, more opportunity to be heard, to be recognized, and to be elevated to control your destiny and to map your own journey. So we hope after you have listened to our distinguished keynote panel, taken in the wisdom of our individual workshops and connected with your fascinating fellow attendees that you feel ready to leave this place and be able to do more, more to advance yourself, more to improve your workplace, more to engage your community, and more to enhance your homes because we know that it is the elegant touch and timeless wisdom of women like you that makes everything mo better. <laughs> and now it's my honor to recognize those who have worked to make more possible today. First, we want to recognize the women of the Women of Color Task Force. The task force is one of the oldest staff development networks in higher education in the nation, offering informal mentoring, monthly networking meetings, summer professional development programs, and a fall leadership development retreat to support and develop University of Michigan staff. We are so very proud of our work, and we are pleased to be part of the University of Michigan tradition of developing administrative leaders who carry out the research and learning mission of the university, which helps set us apart as the leaders and the best. 
Will all the current members of the Women of Color Task Force please stand and remain standing? These dedicated women support the task force. Thank you. These dedicated women support the task force by helping to plan this conference and our other career development activities. Please give your colleagues a hand of applause for the wonderful, impactful university service. Now will all persons who have served on the task force at any time over the past 37 years please stand. <laughs> you laid the foundation for the work that we continue today, and we hope that we have made you proud. Thank you for your service. You all may be seated. It is now with gratitude that we recognize our 2019 conference sponsors. These are the leaders who encourage and support staff development every day at the University of Michigan. Support for this conference was provided by the Office of the Provost, which provides baseline funding for the Women of Color Task Force. University Human Resources, the College of Literature, Science, and Arts, of which I'm a very proud alumni. <laughs> Michigan Medicine Human Resources, the Ross School of, Bu of Business, and Precision Health at the University of Michigan, a cross-campus initiative aimed at innovating healthcare through the exploration of genomics and the social and environmental and determinants of health so that we may better treat patients and make sure that we get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. We wanna give a very special thank you to Golden Limousine for providing the shuttle from Palmer Park and Structure to the Michigan League. And finally, to TIAA, our Platinum Plus corporate sponsor for the sixth straight year. <laughs> TIAA is the premier financial service provider for people who work in academia, research, medical, and cultural fields. And they have been a financial supporter of this conference for more than 20 years. We are thrilled to have present today representatives from, from both the Michigan Ann Arbor Regional Offices. And a very special thank you to the following sponsors who we invite to the podium to share remarks with us. Ms. Tiffany Mara, Executive Director for the Center of the Education of Women. Dee Hunt, Chief Human Resource Officer for Michigan Medicine. Ms. Teresa Saramovsky, Director of Financial Consulting for TIAA. And Ms. Loretta Thomas, Associate Vice President for Human Resources. These. These women, through their own careers in support of our work, exemplify living a life of doing more, being more, and giving more. Let us give a rousing applause to each of them as they greet us. Good morning. My name is Tiffany Mar, and I'm the director at CEW, formerly known as the Center for the Education for Women. It's my honor to bring you greetings this morning in this particularly momentous day it is, as it is International Women's Day, as well as this 37th time that this conference has happened. And I would be remiss not to acknowledge Janice Rubin, who's the WCTF leader, um, who is behind the scenes doing all the work um, for her efforts every year to pull this thing off. It's an amazing effort and it's amazing feat of all the WCTF members who play an incredible role in making today happen. You may have noticed only a few people stood up today. The membership is actually over 100 people, and they are all around you, um, you know, getting people here, getting people to the different sessions. I invite you to introduce yourself to them, as they're all really amazing women here to support you. And so please do make yourself known to them, and I hope you'll find the network a place of support for you. Um, the theme for International Women's Day is balance. And I want to talk about this just for a second. It's balance for the better. It's a focus on gender balanced boardrooms, government, media coverage, wealth, sports coverage, you know, across the gamut, employment. And while gender balance is essential, you know, we have to be at the table. It's not the only part of the equation, right? 
We have to also be included and treated with respect and be heard and make sure our voices are respected in the same way that everybody else's at the table is respected. And I think that's what this conference is about. We've cho Janice and her team have chosen Amplifying Voices because it's not just about being in equal numbers. We see equal numbers and we still hear people talking about, I didn't feel heard. It doesn't mean if there are five of us at the table and one other person, one non-female at the table, we can still feel not heard or respected. So we need to move beyond just balance and diversity. But as our DEI plan here at this fine university points us to, we need to also work on equity and inclusion. And so what does that mean? It means that all of us demand respect, that we're treated equally, that we're included at the decision-making tables of who gets promotions, who gets tenure, um, how policies are decided. We need to be at those tables so we can change this place. <clears throat> you know, and beyond just decision-making, it's amplifying each other's voices, right? So how many times have you seen a person sitting at a table with their head down? You know, that horrible look on their face of not being heard. We've all seen it. What can we do to support them, to repeat something that they've said, to do a simple act of like, I heard Pat Coleman Burns say, right? She was the first person to say that. She was not the third person to say it, right? It's simple things like that that really make us be respected and treated as equals at the table. The Women of Color Task Force, it's a priority project to me and to CEW because it affects directly you know, the CEW's mission at empowering women in underserved communities at the university. It provides resources to staff across campus, um, staff who feel marginalized, whether you're a woman of color or not. If you feel marginalized, you're welcome at WCTF. Male, female, race, doesn't matter. Um, they're there to support you, any marginalized person at this university who doesn't feel like their voice is an equal. So I truly hope you'll reach out to the WCTF members, as I've mentioned before. Um, they support the advancement of each other, as well as through conferences like this and other programs throughout the year, the advancements of those who aren't members of WCTF. So please be on the lookout for their website and find other events that you can join and be a part of. Now, women of color face unique challenges in the workplace and in higher education. Um, you know, we have to acknowledge that and own that because if we don't, we can't create change. If we let it be a hidden secret, if we don't call it what it is, we can't create change and we can't change policies for the better. So at CEW, we own it. We use research and data. We use qualitative work to acknowledge the challenge and bring it to leadership so that we can change things on the back end for the better for everybody. When we change policy on behalf of one person, it changes policy for everybody. It rises all ships at the same time, and that's what we try and do at CEW. And it's an honor to be a part of the organization. Um, I hope you'll stop by CEW to say hi. My, I have an open door policy, as do many staff. Please stop by just to say hi. We've also just renovated our space so that it's open and welcome to anybody in a supportive community. So please come, get a free cup of coffee, make yourself known to us at CEW and to WCTF. We're here for you. Um, we've called our new space the home away from home, um, and I truly hope when you show up there that that's how it feels to you, like a welcoming, home-like environment. Um, we'll be launching a couple of new programs that I want just to make you aware of. Um, one, in August, we'll be launching an online module called the Counts Module. Um, all right, what do we officially have it called at this point? The Toolkit for Supporting Student Success. And the idea behind it is that all of us as staff, we play an integral role in what academic success means at this university. We might be the only person that a student feels comfortable talking to because for whatever reason, they identify us as the, peop the, peop the person that they're comfortable with. And so the toolkit is intended <clears throat> to provide you with additional resources for how you can support non-traditional students. I hope you'll take part in it. It's gonna be launched campus-wide through learning and professional development in collaboration with human resources and um, organizational learning. I hope when you see it, you'll join voluntarily and that you'll encourage other staff in your offices to participate as well. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the generous, generosity of all conference sponsors. If you'll take a look at the back of your program, they're all listed back there. <clears throat> you know, it's an amazing group of organizations that have put their money and their time behind this conference, and so we have to acknowledge that, that those contributions are what make today and the 37 years of this conference possible. 
Um, if those of you who are affiliated with one of the organizations that li that's listed, if you could please stand, um, I gra greatly appreciate it, just so that a, a face is put to these fine organizations. Oh, I'm calling on you all later. So yeah, so TIA is standing right back there. Yeah. <laughs> I'd also like to pay special thanks to university partners, including the Office of the Provost, and we have representatives here today, Michigan Medicine, and Dee Hunt, a university human resources and voices of the staff. Loretta Thomas here, who was the brainchild of voices of the staff. As a participant in it, I truly felt like what I suggested and what my team suggested made a difference. And that's an amazing feeling as a staff member here at the university. So thank you to you, um, Loretta, as well as the Department of African and African American Studies, the College of Literature, Sciences and Arts, and Ross School of Business. TIA has been a major sponsor of this conference since 2003, and I greatly appreciate their contributions, their guidance, their perspective, and their continued support of not just this, but many CEW um, initiatives that we hold throughout the year. Many of the representatives are here today from offices across the country. Um, I'd like to highlight a few that I see right back there. Uh, Doug and Julie. Um, I know Teresa will be joining us later, Shar. Um, and there are a couple people who are also working a booth up at um, the Michigan League. If you could all please just stand to be recognized. They are major contr contributors to this conference. And again, without their support, today would not be possible. <clears throat> now I'd like to turn the mic over to Dee Hunt. She's the Chief Human Resources Officer for Michigan Medicine. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Good morning, everyone. You guys look really great from standing here. Can I just tell you that this room is full. So welcome again um, to the 37th conference. This is amazing. So um, there's only a couple people or maybe one or two people been around for more than 35 or 37 years. So to those, we thank you for even moving this forward. And from today, we just want to talk about how we move forward. So we are another, this is another opportunity for us to come together, thankful that we can have our staff, our faculty, our students, our friends, our family to join us for a day of learning. And that's what this is going to be, a day of learning. And we're going to be talking about career education. We're going to talk about diversity and inclusion strategies how we manage stress as women is going to be very helpful, and mentoring. Whatever we learn, we need to know how to pass it on so that those coming after us will have a better opportunity than we do. And annually, this conference provides so many learning opportunities. This is my second conference as an employee of the University of Michigan, so I'm excited to be here. But today we'll be hearing from a panel of well knowledgeable um, leaders in this work that will help us move forward. So let us not forget that we will be learning something, so we should be listening as we learn, because this is information that is going to be very valuable to us, whether we are at work and whether we are at home. We can take this information and use it wisely. Um, you will also learn not only from the presenters and the panel guests, you'll be learning from those sitting in the seats right next to you. So take advantage of their wisdom and knowledge as well. So we're here today to learn, to listen, to share, and then participate in something. So what I would like you to do is to participate in what our theme is. It says amplifying voices. This is a great auditorium to test this. So why don't we use our voices to say we're moving from diversity to inclusion, okay, all at once. I used to be a choir director, so don't embarrass me. <laughs> don't embarrass me. So we're going to say together, moving from diversity to inclusion, all right? Moving from diversity to inclusion. Now, that was all right. <laughs> but I know this can be done better. So that was our test, so let's just do it again. Moving from diversity to, you see that? That was really good, thank you. So take the time today to put what you learn into action. 
Don't just sit here and take it and walk away. Put it into action. And that's what moving is. Moving is moving towards something. So a quote that I found was, motivation is knowing you are learning, you are growing, and you're succeeding towards your desired outcome while sustaining positive momentum. Let's not stop moving. Let's keep moving till diversity, from diversity to inclusion for all. So what we need to do is amplify our voices no matter where we are. We need to be heard. We should be heard. And we're very knowledgeable women and men who should be listened to at all times. And I am so excited for the panel that you're here, our keynote panel. They have tons of information that will help us with this journey. So I encourage you once again, take what you learned today, put it into action. Let's move forward and have a wonderful day. Well, good morning, everyone. It is our distinct pleasure from TIAA to be the Platinum Plus sponsor again this year for this wonderful conference. My name is Teresa Serafimovsky, and it's my pleasure to again bring you greetings from TIAA again this year. I am a proud uh, alumni of the University of Michigan Dearborn, and I am now a proud mom of a University of Michigan Flint. Um, incoming freshman, and I have one more at home, so I'll get her here on Central Campus. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, especially about uh, diversity and inclusion. TIAA has been on a journey of its own for several years. Under the leadership of our CEO, Roger Ferguson, back in 2016, we actually started a company-wide journey to inclusion. We recognize very quickly, as many of the other speakers have discussed today, is that diversity is a start, but inclusion is truly the destination. And so we started with a company-wide um, individual groups where we had small groups of employees discuss diversity, inclusion, and more importantly, go over biases and ways to overcome and ways to make sure, as many have noted, the, the journey and the destination is not just that seat at the table, but a voice at the table and a voice that can be heard. So for over 100 years, we've had the privilege, the pleasure of working with all of you here at the University of Michigan. And since 1919, when the University of Michigan became TIAA's very first client, this marriage came together, and we look forward to continuing to learn from this conference every year because many of the teachings that we've had over the past 20 years, we've had an association with the conference, we've taken those learnings back, put it into our programs, and I am very excited to see what the panel has to bring today. So thank you all, and we appreciate to continue our journey together today and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Hi, y'all. <laughs> How you doing this morning? Isn't there always a sense of reunion, a sense of renewal, a sense of reinvestment in ourselves on this day? I think it's one of the best days on the university calendar. And I hope you will appreciate that. How many of you, is this your first conference? Oh, wow, at least a third of the audience. You'll be back next year. <laughs> Absolutely. How many of you have been to more than 10 conferences? That's incredible. Thank you for your investment in yourself. Amplifying voices. Let's think about tomorrow night's game. <laughs> no matter which Michigan institution you'll be rooting for, I know where I will be. <laughs> Let's imagine this is Chrysler Center. And we're down to 72 to 72. And you want to tell the team that you believe in them and you believe in yourself. Let's hear a cheer, amplifying voices for yourselves. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
go blue. But I have family members who will be saying go green. And everyone will come out a winner because they're, they're battling for a championship. And that's what you're doing too. You're creating the champion in you. You're creating the champion in, in your team. And you're creating the victors that are the University of Michigan by your mere presence here today. One of the key aspects is learning our stories about each other in the journey to inclusion. What I'd like you to do right now is begin the networking attribute of this conference. Those of you that are sitting with people you know, I want you to stretch out and meet someone you've never met before or someone you know a little bit about. I believe there's no power greater than a community discovering what it cares about. So I want you to introduce yourselves to at least one, if not two other people you've never met and share something that you care about. Right now, go to it. <laughs> Meet someone you've never met before. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's come back together. Yay, the voices. I imagine you shared what you cared about. I imagine you shared that you care about learning. I imagine that you shared that you care about family. I imagine that you shared that you're learning and you care about that journey. And I imagine that you cared about work and community service and other many, many things that make up who we are. But in amplifying the voices that you just did, as loud as you shouted for tomorrow night, you make a difference in the power that you own in your daily journey during your career at the University of Michigan. I thank you for that, and I invite you to increase that power with your interaction today. Make the most of every moment that you have in learning for yourself and learning others' stories, owning those stories, and letting those inspire you for the future as you move, as we all move together to inclusion. I would be remiss if I didn't ask all current and former members of Voices of the Staff who have been the voice for the staff now for 11, tw for 12 years, if you would please stand and receive our thank you for the work you do to make the university a better place for the members of the staff of the university. <laughs> Voices is in its recruitment season. Um, and there is a table over at the Michigan League. So if you'd like to learn more about the work the Voices does on your behalf, uh, please stop and interact with the folks at the table. 
My um, sincere appreciation to all of the sponsors, um, particularly TIAA, who by supporting us makes a major investment in education, and they've done that for as long as has been mentioned, 2003, but I know the spirit of investment in education was already there. And now, do more, more for yourself, more for your families, more for your teams, more for the units, more to make the University of Michigan a premier employer for our beauty, our richness, our learning, are correcting our mistakes, owning it, and moving forward on the journey to inclusion. Have a wonderful day. And now the panel. Good morning. My name. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Serena Akil. I am the administrator of the doctoral program in immunology here at the University of Michigan, and also a very proud member of the influential and industrial industrious Women of Color Task Force. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan was founded through the Treaty of Fort Meigs in 1817, when the Anishinaabe the three Fires Confederacy and the Ojibwe, Odawe, and Potawatomi, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandotte nations, ceded portions of their land so that their children could be educated. The purpose of this statement is to show respect for indigenous peoples and recognize their enduring relationships to the land. Practicing acknowledgement raises awareness about histories that are often suppressed or forgotten. I am delighted to welcome to our 37th annual career conference our panel of accomplished thought leaders and trailblazers. Our panelists this morning will give insight and understanding on multicultural issues, help our audiences consider perspectives other than their own, encourage civil debate, as well as broaden the basis for critical thought and promote cultural understanding. Our panelists are doers who often challenge mainstream assumptions and will provide a forum for us to deepen our knowledge and awareness of issues and opportunities for change in our global society. They will discuss the DEI strategies that corporations and educational institutions can implement, as well as best practices employees can use to create a more inclusive workplace. Today, we are here to actively listen to an engaging discussion amongst our very own. Distinguished lifelong educator, Assistant Vice Pro Provost Dilip Das, our Michigan treasurer, Larita Thomas, who is also Associate Vice President of Human <laughs> Resources, and groundbreaker Cynthia Bowman, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the Bank of America. Facilitating this discussion, is a very energetic, authentic, and inviting Taryn Petrick, Diversity and Inclusion Director of the U University of Michigan Ross School of Business. Taryn has nearly 20 years of progressive experience at the University of Michigan, teaching courses, overseeing research, research teams, and training students, staff, and faculty on issues of social inequality, inequity, bystander intervention, and intergroup relations. As an experienced leader in diversity and inclusion, she is passionate about creating intentional ways for individuals and groups to explore how their own identity, culture, family background, and personal experiences affect their perception of social inequalities and inequities that exist in our society. Please join us in welcoming our very own ally with a solid background in diversity and inclusion and facilitator of this lively discussion, Taryn Petrick. <laughs> Dr. Doss is a lifelong educator who began his career as a public school teacher and coach in Minnesota, and then as an international school biology teacher and coach in India. 
A significant focus of his current work as Assistant Vice Provost for Equity, Inclusion, and Academic Affairs at the University of Michigan is on access to and success at the University of Michigan for first-generation college, Pell Grant eligible, underrepresented minority, and transfer students. Dr. Doss prides himself on staying sharp on new research and new opportunities for creating progressive partnerships. Making connections, drawing people and groups together towards similar goals, mentoring and building networks for those with fewer strands of support are essential to his role. Undoubtedly, if you're looking for an essential, essential reading list of must-read books to stay woke, check out the bookshelf in his office. <laughs> Please join us in welcoming the well-read and respected Dr. Das. Larita Thomas is Associate Vice President for Human Resources at the University of Michigan and is quite simply a national treasure. Thank you. She is responsible for human resource policy for all U of M campuses. Her human resources career spans roles in the financial industry, higher education, and healthcare. She serves as a, a leader in HR professional organizations and on numerous community service boards. Lorita shines at creating work environments that, un that unleash the full potential of people. She is a recognized leader in human resources at Michigan and throughout the country. The type of leader who always takes the time to create opportunities for others. As many of you know, Larita has the extraordinary ability to bring words to life. Please join us in welcoming everyone's role model, Larita Thomas. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cynthia Bowman is Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Bank of America. In this role, she serves as the Chief Strategist for Diversity and Inclusion globally focused on leading programs, initiatives, and policies that actively support the bank's diverse and inclusive workplace. Cynthia is responsible for keeping diversity and inclusion at the forefront for managers throughout the company. Ms. Bowman has been recognized by the Georgia National Diversity Council as one of the most powerful and influential women, and Diversity MBA Magazine as one of the top 50 senior executives under 50. <laughs> she was also awarded a Trailblazer Award and was recognized by Black Enterprise as a top executive in corporate diversity. <laughs> when a law restricting transgender bathrooms rights took effect last year in North Carolina, igniting a national backlash, Cynthia wanted Bank of America employees to do one thing, talk about it. As a result, Bowman helped to create a program known as Courageous Conversations. Her idea was to create a more inclusive workplace by establishing an open dialogue through online message boards and employee events about sensitive political issues that are often hard to discuss in the workplace. A few summers ago, during the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, Bank of America organized a forum in New York where employees from different racial groups shared their feelings about the string of shootings of black men by police and the unrest that followed in cities across the country. Bowman believes in the importance of opening up the dialogue because if you open up the dialogue, you can create better empathy and understanding. Please join us in welcoming our keynote speaker, a fierce proponent of courageous conversations and accompanying actions that embolden diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Zarina. That is by far one of the best set of introductions that I have ever heard. Let's give Zarina a round of applause. <laughs> that was amazing. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's hear that again. We keep doing that. Good morning. Good morning. Woo! Good morning. We are really excited to be here with everybody this morning and to talk through uh, how does diversity, equity, inclusion play out both in higher education and in the world of business. And we want to really make this a facilitated conversation where 
we're, we'll say it's informally formal. Uh, we have a set of questions, and then we'll also see what comes up in the conversation. And so we invite our panelists to be their most authentic, uh, honest, personal selves as you, as you see bringing forward the, the work that you have done and sharing your experiences and journeys with us. We cannot talk about inclusion without talking about identity. And when we say identity and talk about identity, we really do mean the broad spectrum around gender, identity, race, ethnicity, citizenship, physical, mental, cognitive, learning, ability, disability, veteran status, across the board. And so as we move through our conversation around diversity and inclusion, let's keep in mind the broad spectrum, as well as those areas and identities that we are really moving forward and breaking barriers for uh, throughout uh, both our worlds in higher education and, and, and in business. And so we know that these conversations can sometimes be difficult to talk about, uh, and that when we want to raise uh, and normalize conversations around race and gender and sexual orientation, that that, that can sometimes be difficult. Uh, and so what we hope is that we can do that, that we can do that here, that we can uh, potentially name some issues, talk about all the positive successes that we have had, and where do we see the future going. Uh, so we invite all of us to participate and, and, and think about what's our role in moving the work forward as well. So I'd love to start with uh, just more of a personal question for our panelists around what how, what was your personal path or your journey that led you to want to pursue diversity, equity, inclusion in your career? Uh, we know that there's our personal life and then our career life, and sometimes they're seamless, sometimes they're not. But what were one or two moments that really brought you to want to be here, want to be in this space 24-7? Uh, <laughs> I'll, we'll start with Cynthia. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. This institution has a special place in my heart, and I really feel um, on this particular day that it's so great to have a conversation with such an amazing audience, so thank you. You know, I go back to when I was younger. So how many people are familiar with Camden, New Jersey? Okay. If I asked you what you knew about Camden, I would guess that there are some amazing stories about revitalization, but many times people think about poverty or inadequate school systems, high crime rates. Well, I was raised in Camden up until the fifth grade. And while I was there, I was in an institution, it was Parkside Elementary, and I remember having instructors that, similar to my mother, always instilled in me the value that I can do or achieve anything that I wanted to do in life. And my mother decided around the fifth grade to move from Cam Camden to Denver, Colorado. Maybe it was because she viewed that they had better school systems, the environment was clean, and so she packed up her things and left and uh, made a place for herself. Several months later, she sent for my brother um, as well as myself, and we moved to, to Denver. And I remember after a couple of weeks of school, I came home and I told my mom that I was not being challenged. Now, mind you, when I was in Camden, New Jersey, I was a part of an academically talented program, and I remember a teacher, his name was Mr. Smith, and he inspired us to be our personal best, and I had teachers like that throughout my upbringing while in Camden. So to come into an environment where I just simply did not feel challenged or someone made an assumption about me quickly was just not natural to me. And what I learned earlier in life, what we know now, is that people make perceptions of you in one-tenth of a second. And within 30 seconds, those perceptions are fully formed. And typically, whenever they receive new information, it's really hard to challenge that initial perception. So whether it was now that I'm a black student in a predominantly white environment, or maybe it was possibly because they knew where I came from and they understood the history of Camden school systems, but I realized very early as a child how assumptions and biases and stereotypes impact someone's ability and their own mindset about their accomplishments and what they can achieve. And that's really stayed with me throughout my life. So whether it was times in corporate America or roles that I took on in high school or areas where I tried to advocate in college, DNI has been fundamental to who I am just based on my own upbringing. And so now in the role that I have in corporate America, it's really important to leverage difference for the power of good mm -hmm. and to challenge outcomes such that experience that I receive coming up are not the norm for our students in this world today. Mm -hmm. Thank 
Thank you. Ooh, we can clap that out. <laughs> Dilip Alarita. Go right ahead, Dilip. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, again, privileged and uh, humbled to be here in front of you in this beautiful, uh, almost decadent hall. So uh, happy to be here. Um, I would say this, that I was lucky enough to be raised as what is known as a third culture kid, which means that, um, that my parents came from very different, wildly different cultures. And that, that allowed me to learn about uh, two different spaces, two different places. Uh, ways of thinking, and that in itself is a privilege and a benefit to learn in, the, in that way. And the third culture meaning that you have to find your way between those in some way. And that, that is, a, is a gift, and I'm always appreciative of that. Um, and then when I uh, started um, post-secondary, I was drawn to <clears throat> the study of ecology because um, it seemed really natural to me, no pun intended, that the idea of, uh, of the strength of any ecosystem depends on the health and the diversity of all organisms in it. That seemed so uh, logical, and I wanted, I was drawn to that. And, um, <clears throat> and then as the uh, phenomenon of diversity, equity, and inclusion began taking hold necessarily in, all, in, as, in large institutions and small institutions, I was also naturally drawn to that because like ecology, it's exactly the same way. Um, we cannot have a healthy, vigorous, uh, uh, you know, livelihood, um, ecosystem, uh, community without diversity and inclusion. So that's a short story of how I got here. Thank you. Uh, Taryn asked us this question in the back, and I said, pull the mic because I could talk for a while. So <laughs> I mean, I mean, she, right she right. will cut, cut <laughs> me off. But um, how many of you read Becoming by Michelle Obama? Oh my goodness, you've got some work to do. <laughs> Go right out of here and order it on Amazon. Those of you that have read it are saying yes. She tells her story of growing up on the south side of Chicago and becoming the first lady and living in the White House. And it's a remarkable story in the way that she tells it because it's very real. And you can learn how to tell the best of your story, the challenges of your story, the things that people make judgments about immediately. And so I've been trying to think about that question. And my immediate answer was I was born in this journey. But there's some, there were some trigger moments that I will never forget that I think inspire you to do your best. Many of you in your experiences have been told what you will never do or what you can't do or that's not possible for you. And too often people believe it. Well, I had parents that didn't believe it and supported me in doing some strange and weird things at the time that even now I think about could have gotten me killed, but they were important to stand for. So in the 10th grade classroom in Ontario, California, I was a member of the National Forensics League and we had to debate in our classroom. And the name I drew and the topic I drew and the person that I was to debate, he announced very quickly that he was the son of the Grand Wizard and he refused to debate me And that in that area. And the debate teacher said, well, then I guess you're leaving the class and um, you'll fail the class for non-participation. So he chose to do the debate. I don't even remember the topic. But the class roared for my part of the debate, which represented the stories of so many people in my place whose stories I shared. And his way of accepting the class's decision as to who won the debate was to say, well, you only won because of the white blood flowing in you. 
And then I said, well, let's have a talk about how that white blood got in me. <laughs> um, <laughs> in that same school, we have guidance counselors. And the guidance, despite my GPA, the guidance counselor said, well, you're colored and you're out of state and your dream of going to the University of Michigan will never happen. My father was from Detroit, his family was from Detroit, and all I heard all my life was about this pinnacle in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and how much my dad wanted us to be the first to break those barriers and come to the University of Michigan. So it was the dream of my father and all that had invested in him and my mother supporting him that said to me, I'll do everything I can to get into the University of Michigan from California. And when that happened, I brought with me the heritage, the legacy of the sacrifice of a whole community of people that wanted that to happen for me. And having that happen during the Civil Rights Movement, all of the can'ts that are put in front of us, in this journey to inclusion, the more we understand each other's stories and what drives us and what creates our passion, the more we understand what you've already overcome to be here, the more we understand the dreams you have for yourself and for those you care about whether they're your children or the neighborhood or the classrooms where these shapes happen, the more we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So a common theme between the three of you, you each uh, came into this work for different reasons, but the theme is that you had critical moments, those critical experiences in your youth or in the formation of your, yourself and your identity to say, hey, I, I want to do this for a long time, right? I want to move this work forward. I want to be able to build community and inclusion um, in ways that maybe you didn't even have that for yourselves as you were, as you were growing up. So thank you so much for that. We wanna take a three minutes for you all just to turn to somebody next to you to share with that person, why do you care about diversity and inclusion? Why are you here? Why are you at the Women of Color Conference? Why are you listening to these fabulous people? Why do you care? We're just gonna do this for three minutes. I want you all to connect with each other to create that, that vibrancy and amplification of the voices. We'll tell you when those three minutes are up. Go. I love
Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. <laughs> So here is what we know if we're going to make, continue to make progress in diversity and inclusion is that we need to have each other and that we need to be able to have, to share our stories about why it's important to us. And sometimes just breaking that ice and being able to turn to the person and say, this is why I care. We don't even realize that people care until we ask or until we share. So we hope that as you go through the rest of the conference and rest of the day and hopefully as, as you move forward in your own workplace that you can just pose these questions. Why do you care? This is why I care, right? Sometimes you have to take that, that initiative too. So thank you. We're going to be asking a couple questions throughout, so <laughs> be prepared on that end. Uh, <laughs> we are, uh, are going to switch a little bit and talk about our uh, DEI strategic work and our plans and the momentum that has been created at a number of, of, of workplaces as well as within the country around raising the conversation and really saying, we've got to tackle this. We have got to make this a priority. And a lot of times that is because of those critical moments. Just like you all had critical moments in your life that brought you here, there are critical moments that happen in our workplaces that make us say, we've got to, we've got to change, we've got to make a difference. And so when we think about for, for whether it be at the University of Michigan or at Bank of America, you've been on a journey, but what are some of those moments of success that you are proud of uh, that you can, you can say, we, we're doing this right. We feel good about this. And, and what is that? And why do you feel like that has, is moving us closer to inclusion, from diversity to inclusion? Please. So I'll start. You know, I think that at our corporation, I don't know that I would say from, but it's an and. And one of the reasons is when I think about diversity, I mean, our goal is to mirror the clients and communities we serve. And that's at all levels of leadership. And certainly as an organization, we're there holistically. We're over 50% women as an organization. We're 45% racially, ethnically diverse, so our non-white population, and that certainly mirrors the world. We have efforts around allyship, over 25,000 visible allies in support of the LGBT plus community, a commitment to hire over 10,000 veterans uh, by 2020, which we're well on our way. Um, as well as our focus on the disabled population, but more importantly, just an inclusion, an inclusive environment for all. I will tell you, I think that those numbers just don't come uh, without a commitment from the top. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, that would be my top point is that our CEO and the commitment of our leadership team and our board, this is just not about the right thing to do. It's about the fact that it's imperative for business mm -hmm. and for us to be a viable. For us to be a viable organization, you know, our CEO was on a panel for Bloomberg and he got a question around what's the business case around women. And he said, I dismissed the question about answering the business case. If you don't understand the power and influence of our women as consumers and the fact that we need to have women in our organization to open up the dialogue and to understand the needs of our clients and why that's critical to our success, then we're not really talking about the right question. Um, and that was from the top. And so, mm -hmm. and so the second thing I will say, in addition to commitment that I think is really driving change, is being very transparent about the issues that we truly need to solve for as an organization, and driving accountability and a culture of inclusion with our leadership and our managers that is creating a different set of outcomes and allowing us to continue to see some of the great progress we've had as an organization. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. So Dilip and Loretta have different, uh, do different types of work at the university and have different uh, ways of approaching DEI within the respective areas as well. And so from your perspective and your, your area of influence, what would you say? Many people ask me what's different about our current strategic initiative around diversity, equity, and inclusion from the ones that have come before, from the Black Action Movement to the Michigan Mandate to other specific top-down-led commitments in this journey. 
And my answer to that is this president asked to hear every voice. He challenged us to make this a grassroots as much as a top-down commitment, and he certainly has been courageous in the commitment that he is leading uh, to make this campus one of leaders and best in the journey to inclusion. But when he said, I want town halls, I want to go out and talk to people, I want to hear from people, I want to learn what people's experiences are, and I, be I believe the best ideas are among the people that achieve our mission every single day of teaching and research and patient care and service to the community. And so he listened and his leadership team listened to what we needed to do to make a difference here. And so there were many learnings along this process and there will be many more as our identities evolve and change and we need to learn more about respect for each other. But I think a singular success I would point to is how many of you have participated in the unconscious bias training that we have reached 30,000, so most of you probably have experienced it. And every single person that has gone to that course learned something about themselves. And in learning about themselves and what others' perceptions are of those stereotypes, et cetera, every single person made a commitment to be more aware, to be more open, to understand how biases confront opportunity and possibilities. And I think with everybody paying attention to that, I believe we'll have more opportunity to achieve our goals than we've had in the past with just this is important, so do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Philip? So uh, l let me let me just say this, that uh, the, the DEI strategic plan, which President Schlissel launched in 2016, is historic and unprecedented on, on any campus in this country. And it's a significant, and I'll use that word that Rita used, courageous investment. And you can't have progress without investment. And we must move the needle on this. And let me also underline the fact that of the 51 plans, that's the grassroots up on this campus doing five-year strategic plans. Uh, there are 99 <laughs> DEI leads, and 75% of those DEI leads are women. Who's driving change in diversity, equity, and inclusion on this campus? Women. One-third, by my count, of those 99 DEI leads are women of color. Who's driving change in diversity, equity, inclusion on this campus? Women of color. Uh, I would also suggest that uh, the investment that I speak of is necessary because if we're not going to make any, if we're, not, if we're going to make some change, we have to invest. Let me use one example. We all know that in the last 30 years, there's been um, a tremendous disinvestment in both K-12 education and higher education. And that's fallen on the backs in terms of paying for college on students and families themselves, uh, which often uh, provide in mean tremendous loan volume, although U, U of M has done a significant uh, step in reducing loans and providing via the Go Blue Guarantee opportunities to go, come to college with minimal loan. But it also requires reinvestment back into the K-12 community and that's also what we have done uh, because uh, we cannot expect to see the same outcomes uh, with wildly different investments in K-12 schooling. And so we must look to that if we seek as Cynthia mentioned, uh, a campus that reflects our community, we have to invest back into the community that has been systematically disinvested in over the last 30 years.
So Dilip, I think that that leads us into the, the large amount of advancement that we've had in moving forward DEI in the workplace, but that we still have more, a lot more and a lot, uh, there's a there's a big gap still, right? We still have to move forward uh, in advancement. And so, from the perspective of you all, what are those what are those gaps, and how do we fill that, and how do we really move to uh, advance DEI even further than where we've been? Yeah. So I'll start with one of the things that's really important to me. So a little bit about my also background. I have an a engineering and computer science degree, which levers itself really well from an analytical perspective, because <laughs> data is really important to understand where you're trying to go in this space. And I just want to sort of piggyback on something that you said about the staff, which is incredible. Um, but in addition, you also have the leadership, because although you have individuals like myself that are driving diversity and inclusion across an organization, and certainly I have a staff and team that is global, leadership and the commitment of leadership who ultimately owns the decisions that are made to create increased representation or managers who are ultimately responsible for driving an inclusive environment are, are more actually critical sometimes because it really does need to be driven from the institution with support of the infrastructure of the DNI staff. And that's another an element that mm -hmm. enables success. Um, but, but just generally speaking, kind of, you know, so, so where do we go from here and where are the areas of opportunity? Um, I mentioned that our goal is the mirror to clients and communities we serve, so that's one, that's representation, and we do that very well holistically, and we recognize that there are certain pockets of groups that historically have been underrepresented, whereas you move up to the top, we need to make more progress. And so what we've done is we've gotten much more granular and specific around understanding where those pockets of inclusion occur. We have become more transparent with data for our leadership such that at very specific and granular levels, you can understand where we are making progress, but more importantly, where we have work to do. And we're sharing that data more openly because without understanding the issues, it's hard to define specific actionable ways to, to drive improvement. And we're also taking that down to a level of understanding what that means in terms of hiring the levers that usually change representation or promotion or pull through as well as retention and have targeted processes where we've been doubling down on things like in our hiring process, whether it's diverse slates or diverse interview teams or promotion is understanding pull through and issues that are occurring throughout that pipeline and how do we go that, about that in more targeted ways or simple stay conversations and trying to keep and retain the um, leadership that we have. And so it takes a very rigorous and ongoing process, I think led with data that really enables progress over time, at least in our corporation. And then lastly, what I will say is just because you have diversity, which is I think the point earlier, doesn't mean you have true inclusion. And so we can focus on numbers and progress, but you also need an environment where everyone feels like they can bring their whole self to work. Individuals can be their authentic self. Individuals don't feel like they have to cover to be successful. And so we focus a lot on a culture of inclusion through things like unconscious bias training, um, through things like inclusive learning. We have started to turn our learning on its side a bit. And so for instance, we just had a session um, which we've been calling Let's Get Real. But we focus on those moments of matter for our leaders. And I coined that term because it's the moments where decisions are made where the most bias occurs. Mm -hmm. When you hire, when you promote, who you choose to put on a special project, who gets that next big assignment. And we're trying to mitigate uh, the um, bias that tends to happen such that the outcome or the decision is more inclusive because we know when you interrupt it through things like unconscious bias, you're 50 times more likely to make a decision that's not, mm -hmm. um, that, that's not as, uh, that is more inclusive. So I would say again, it's the dedicated, focus, relentless, not only on representation, but ensuring that everybody who walks through the four walls of your institution feels like they belong and that they are in an inclusive environment and we measure both. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cynthia. I, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate what you had to say specifically around we can have our, our directors or we can have the one person who's kind of dedicated, but that really, really coinciding with what everybody is saying around you have to have that from the top mm -hmm. and it has to be permeated in um, the decision making because um, one person with a title just just isn't gonna do it. We have to have, really create that environment and that community, um, a community effort to move forward. Mm -hmm. Lorita, what would you like to add? 
I think one gap continues to be, we're working very hard on it, but it is well-intentioned people that don't know what to do and believe they don't have the skill or knowledge to do it, to be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And recently, in the last couple of years, we've been involved in uh, trying to address gender harassment and, in particular, the sexual misconduct that keeps women um, uh, in, in the status that we don't want to be on, or, mm -hmm. and we want to have uh, more respect on the campus. And so we've used um, the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching Players to do really quick snippets of a situation that could very much involve sexual harassment mm. um, going on that closes doors and abuses power relations, people that abuse their power relationship over our students and our staff in a gender-based way. And I've sat at a table with very high leaders and after a skit has been suggested to them and they're asked what are they going to do, they stare at each other. Mm -hmm. And they really don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's a fear. There's a fear of doing the wrong thing and there's a fear of retaliation. Mm -hmm. And one of the most significant things I think we still have to address is the building of that skill and knowledge and applying resources mm -hmm. to people who want to do the right thing and then Others will watch what they're doing and model from that as the leaders put rewards and incentives and, and, and consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the questions I would ask, Cynthia, they introduced you and included courageous conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think those are very important. Could you talk more about your work with courageous conversations? Absolutely. So it started, interestingly enough, with two people on my team. And um, just to give you context, because uh, this was around race, one is a, a woman um, who was white and the other one was an African-American woman. And they both were a part of a situation and they walked away with two totally different interpretations. And to Lurita's point, my, my fundamental belief is people's intentions are usually good. But their perspectives throughout their life and how they have internalized things that are going on in the world had them think about a situation very differently. One felt excluded, one felt the other one chose not to participate, and it was a very important dialogue. And they actually ended up finding this out by talking to each other and then decided to meet over lunch, over a series of months to learn about their own differences and how they perceive the world, how they perceive what's going on. These are people who are focused on diversity and trained. Um, and so they brought the idea to my team and we ended up doing an exercise during one of our offsites. And I realized that they were onto something critical. But it wasn't until I had a lady who came to me, she happens to be lesbian, she's a black woman. This was back in 2016. And we met for coffee, and she said, and this was around the time, remember we had the Pulse nightclub that impacted mm -hmm. the LGBT and the Hispanic Latino community. Then you had Philando Castile, and then Alton Sterling. Then there was the police shootings in Dallas. And there was a lot going on in the world that were impacting so many people. And she said, I cannot focus on my job. These issues are so heavy for me right now that is not enabling me to be productive. And guess what? I walk in and my managers or people who understand who I am aren't even asking me how I'm doing. And I realized that we were onto something. So we started one of our, what I would call, major courageous conversations soon after that. She was on the panel. So sometimes you raise a question, uh, we put you to work. Uh, <laughs> oh, we know that. I'll do well here. <laughs> All those DNI leads up there, though. <laughs> but we, we had a panel on the polarizing topics going on in the world and specifically focused on, on the shootings. We did it in our auditorium, which was referenced earlier. We had a couple hundred people show up. We do it live to desktop, which means anyone can dial in from wherever they are across the globe. We had 7,000 people Ooh. join. Nice. And this was a conversation. We had a Hispanic woman, an Asian woman, a black male, a white male. The moderator uh, was an African-American woman. Um, and then the lady that was on the panel was a black woman who was also gay and, um, or lesbian. And so what we found was it wasn't about right or wrong. It was about people hearing their stories. Mm -hmm. Because the power of telling a story is incredibly impactful. Because what it does is it breaks down your perspective versus my perspective was right or wrong, but, reality that per but recognizing that perception is reality. And for people who don't have to experience that, 
on a day-to-day -day because maybe it doesn't impact you directly or it doesn't impact your child or people that you love directly, but it's impacting someone in such an incredible way that it's polarizing her ability to really be effective at work. And so we found from that session, we posted that replay on our website, it had 20,000 views. So we knew we were onto something. So we've been having these conversations on all different topics since then. We had a topic around social justice and, and equality soon after the election. We had conversations after Charlottesville around the impact of bigotry and hatred on someone's personal life that was taken trying to stand up for equality and what does that mean for us in the community. We've had conversations on the role of the majority in diversity because to Larita's point, there have been, uh, you know, if you think about DNI and its evolution, it started out sort of really about gender and so that excluded males and then it became about race, well then that excluded white males to some extent. And then it was about sort of LGBT issues and that was sort of excluding straight white males. And the point is we need everyone's focus. These issues that are coming up in the world, we should be thinking about it if it hit us at home. Someone that we loved, someone that we cared, would you be quiet? Would you do nothing if it was impacting you? And if your answer is no, then the question I have is, well, why would we want that for anybody else? So in closing, what these conversations are doing, I think, is creating empathy, understanding around difference. Because it's hard to hit up close. When you know someone personally in their story, I really think it changes how people think mm -hmm. and how they would respond around key decisions that hopefully will create more inclusive environments for everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you have, did you want to say something else? I, I absolutely agree. I think normalizing the conversations, raising them to the level of being able to, to really be able to talk across difference is one of the key movements and a lot of that can be done through storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, the personalizing uh, is so important to the experiences uh, that our staff, students, faculty are having, corporate leaders, C-suite folks, managers, uh, entry-level employees across the board and when we ask people to separate their personal from their professional lives that can cause a lot of, a lot of harm in different ways. So I, I love the courageous conversations yeah, idea, thing, absolutely. Lorita made an amazing point, which is sometimes people don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, I, I might say, it doesn't mean you have to go protest tomorrow, but it might mean you're in a meeting where there's an inappropriate joke that's being shared. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're not silent. Because you might not want to, you know, I tell people that you want to sort of coach publicly and praise, um, I mean, coach in private and praise individuals publicly, but sometimes silence is condoning. Mm -hmm. Or it might be in a moment where a woman is speaking, which we know they're twice as likely to be interrupted, mm -hmm. and they make a great point and then someone sort of takes credit. And you redirect them back and say, Larita, that was an amazing mm -hmm. point you just made. I know you just sort of reemphasized it, but thank you so much for that yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's, those are actually skills and techniques that a lot of, of women do to amplify voices, right? Literally amplifying voices in the meeting is, is repeating back what other, other women have said uh, in that moment. So absolutely on that end. I'd just like to pick up on something Cynthia mentioned about the employee who couldn't work because she was so stressed by what was happening around her. And, I, and it struck me, I think one of the things that has happened that's significant is finally uh, recognition uh, of uh, one of the major concepts, I think, in this generation by a University of Michigan professor, Arlene Geronimus, who developed this concept of weathering that was happening not only in black women, but women of color and any, any population, in fact, that was suffering chronic racism and dealing with it on a daily basis. And she found not only cellular level impacts on that that shortened their lives, mm -hmm. but also what was most troubling to her was how weathering impacted uh, women in childbirth. And she found that in, in a study of black women that the later that those women delivered their babies, the more threatening their life chances were. And and, uh, and now she's finally getting the recognition that this is, a, this is an environmental and not a genetic problem mm -hmm. that is uh, all about the, the stress that the body 
absorbs on a daily basis that weathers mm -hmm. you down. Mm -hmm. And it's not related to socioeconomic status either. Because she points out that uh, two things that are, I think, relevant to us here as well, that, that many women of color, for instance, uh, and people of color in general, who leave their support networks from home in order to advance their, their selves, their lives, their careers, and come to a, for example, a predominantly white institution like the university. She says they leave their support systems to get those educations and deal with people who sometimes devalue them on a daily basis in those jobs. And the psychosocial stressors will also weather them. So there's that impact that we see here as well. And finally, the notion that it's not related to how much wealth or health that you have. Um, and we have several prominent examples of wealthy and supremely healthy black women particularly who have given birth later. And the, and the person that I'm thinking of right now is Serena uh, Williams. And it's documented the, the, the terror that she went through in her birth delivery. And this is shown again and again in Professor Geronimus's uh, research of this, this incredible and eroding impact of weathering. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to pick up on that and, and, and understand, I think it, it needs to be discussed more readily because this is not something that people understand and yet it is a reality in the lives of so many, particularly women of color. And that's why the important, the, the, it's so important to be able to acknowledge, name, and provide infrastructure to address these these instances and these situations and the data that we know um, that is impacting our underrepresented, marginalized workforce uh, across the board. What we want to do is do another quick three-minute check-in with each other. Uh, what is one thing that you see going really right in your workplace around diversity and inclusion, and what's one thing that um, you think your workplace can do to bridge a gap? All right, one thing that's going really white, one thing that you can do to bridge a gap, and go. <laughs>
Okay, we are gonna wrap up in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. <laughs> So we know that it is so important to celebrate the work that we know we are doing right and also to have those conversations around what we need to do to move the needle and continue to, to move the needle to fill those gaps. Sometimes we have to start small because the big can feel overwhelming, <laughs> uh, but we need to continue in in those conversations. So thank you and hopefully you can take these conversations back to your offices uh, as well. So we want to transition to talking a little bit about some strategies. Uh, and, and we want, we are here, we, we want to create uh, an environment and a workplace where voices are heard, people feel that, uh, that they are included in conversations and decision making, and that they matter, that they are valued. And so I would love to ask our, our friends up on stage, what are specific strategies that managers can do to create an environment that allows for uh, this type of environment to occur? I think there are a number of things. We've done a lot of studies and work about um, what really matters to staff, the, the level of meaningful work, what matters to people. Um, the meaningful work you get to participate in. And managers are important in creating a line of sight of what we do every day that matters to the people we serve at the University of Michigan in our communities. Um, I think they can help people see and, and draw that pattern. I think managers can go talk to their staff and ask them and tell them, I value your input. I need your ideas for this particular process we're working to improve or this program we're trying to implement and have those individual conversations as well as team-based conversations and really listen to the input they get. We won't always get exactly what we asked for, but your voices and your perspective make a difference in the quality of the outcome of those conversations and those decision-making processes. I think managers can be sensitive to the environment and the amount of stress, and do you help people understand what access they have to healthy programs and the total spirit of health and well-being? And what do you do? Do you play ping pong at lunch and invite people to do that with you? I've seen conference tables turned into ping pong tables. And, and it sends a message of, I value you, we value you as an institution, and take advantage of these things that are great about being at the University of Michigan. I think managers can look for lactation spaces and make sure they're advocating for those. I think managers can make sure there's access to unisex bathrooms or single stall bathrooms so people can be respected that need that. I think managers can represent the quality and excellence of their work in managing up and making sure that ideas leave their unit for what other people can hold. And this is a time when you need to pull the mic because I have you know, another <laughs> whole list. We're going to pull the mic. We're going to pull it. <laughs> but, what I, but I also want to pick up on what you said about I matter. I want every single person in this room right now just say I matter. I matter. And you do. And there's a process for engaging that. I remember a story from someone in Voices of the Staff and she said, by participating in that dynamic where we work on issues that matter most to staff to make this a better place, she learned how to feel empowered. And the chair of her department had made a mistake that offended people in her unit. And she said before her learning about she mattered, she wouldn't have said a thing. But she found the courage as a patient clerk to go to the chair and say, what you said offended people, and we really need to change the programming that you asked us to do. Not only did she win her point, but the whole department applauded her at her desk. You matter, believe you matter, and use today to empower yourself because you make the difference. Woo, love it. I 
I agree wholeheartedly. I would add a few things. So back in 2014, I was in an audience with our employee network. So we have 11 employee networks across the bank, 120,000 memberships. That's grown over 16% year over year, and it's mainly grown by individuals who are not in that natural affinity joining other groups, which we think is great because intersectionality is another way I think we're going to make progress around just having more empathy and understanding around difference. Um, but I asked them how many people felt supported by their managers, and about half the hands went up to be there, to be at this sort of DNI event. And I felt like you know we were onto something, so I took it to our Global Diversity and Inclusion Council, which, by the way, our CEO sits on and never misses a meeting. He's never missed a meeting, just to talk about commitment from the top. And we talked about what we could do differently. So we started this initial session it's called My DNI. And it was about my diversity and inclusion. It was a series of, uh, of focused conversations just around your role as an inclusive leader and a manager at a company. And the sessions were attended and the feedback was like 99, 100% positive in terms of value and impact. We knew we were onto something. So we've been doing it ever, ever since. And we've been having all different types of uh, sessions with our management around inclusion. And the training is not required. Since 2014, we've had 500,000 completions. Right. And so what it tells me is managers care, but to the point earlier, they always don't know what to do. So we've been trying to feed them with information to stretch their thinking, to push the boundaries, to engage, make them more willing to engage in the courageous conversations and discuss the undiscussables. And I'll give you an example. So I talked about the moments that matter, um, but we also had a session called, Can I Say That? And can I say that? We work with our ER team and our legal team to say, what are the issues that managers are not doing right around diversity and inclusion? And it came really down to things that were said that probably were well-intended, but just were sometimes outright offensive or, or inappropriate. That session, managers have loved, and we continue to repeat it. And so the, the one that we did recently was just on the hiring process, town acquisition. And so we created vignettes around probably some edgy topics, but things that unfortunately are truly happening in the world and in the workplace, and then had a conversation around how would you approach this? What is your role as the manager? How would you correct the conversation? How would you interrupt the dialogue? And I think what it's been doing for our leaders is helping them to be better equipped with, quite frankly, topics that are not so, um, that, are, that are a bit edgy, but what is their role as a leader? Because that's why you're here, to create a culture of inclusion for all, to interrupt that and drive the right, more inclusive outcome. The last thing I will say is this. Many times when I hear people say this is difficult, and it is, I tell them from a representation, you hire, you promote, and you retain people every day. I just need you to do it in a way that's more inclusive. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so what I say is, how does it feel to be excluded? Just a few, if I asked you, how many of you have ever felt it being excluded? Raise your hand. Everybody. Everyone. <laughs> how does it feel? Lonely, not good. Terrible, isolated, okay. <laughs> so the point is, the tax on some people of exclusion is even greater. Mm -hmm. So the question for leaders, at its simplest point, is how do you create an environment where people don't feel that way? And sometimes it starts with a simple conversation. Have you ever felt excluded at work? Have I ever done things where you felt isolated? And I think the more people have one-on-one -on -one simple conversations, let's not overcomplicate it, around the reality of exclusion with the goal of true inclusion for all, you will quickly learn from your organization some simple tactics that as a manager in your organization that you can do. Mm -hmm. Love it, thank you. I'll, I'll just pick up briefly on that. You know, there's an old book written by a, uh, kindergarten teacher, I think it's called No One Can Say, No One Can Play, something like that. Inclusive managers have to model inclusiveness, inclusive behavior. They have to, they have to I think, understand that inclusiveness, you know, Scott Page wrote two books on this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, after a significant amount of research uh, demonstrating, without any doubt, that uh, inclusive and diverse teams produce better outcomes 
period. And as, if managers just fully understand that, and it's clear that that's the case, the, that will be one thing. But they have to model the inclusive behavior themselves, too. They have to invite their teams authentically to be involved. What we've seen in many successful units across campuses are those units where a significant percentage of the individuals in those units are involved in action planning and part of subcommittees that are working toward achieving those act action plannings, they're making impressive uh, gains, at least in dialogue and talking about it in comfort levels, in, in, in transparency that's happening in those units. And that's a huge step forward in itself, is, is getting people comfortable in talking. You know, the word courage has been thrown out. And if managers can grasp that mantle of courage, and, in, and sort of break through their fears and anxieties about having uncomfortable conversations. That's what, it, that's what it makes such a big difference. And, and a sense of, um, I think, humility is important too. Mm -hmm. uh, and realizing that as a manager, that doesn't mean that you have to know everything. That's why you have hired a, a, a talented team. Mm -hmm. Give them freedom, don't micromanage them. Let them contribute to the greater whole and invite them to do so. And then finally, I'll just say to Sonia Jacobs, uh, one of my heroes on campus mm -hmm. and in charge of the organizational learning here, that um, I want to alert you that we are going to steal Can You Say That program. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I would agree. I have it written down, too. So we are about to wrap up our time uh, together for this portion of the conference, but want to end with uh, what are our hopes? So when we think about our dreams, where we, where we want to be, whether it's in our lifetime or not, what is one hope that you have uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace? I think some of the, the concepts we've talked about here need to be directly aligned with performance. So we've talked about why do inclusion, and we do inclusion because many of us believe it's the right thing to do, but what we also know is that when we get really good at this, the performance of the individuals, the teams, the unit, and the university excel. And when we unblock the barriers for people to bring, as you said, their best self to work, it makes that part of our lives, which is a huge part, one that can be fulfilling and rewarding, and that shows up in what we contribute on the performance of us as individuals, teams, units, and as a university. And so my hope is that the, the stature that we've enjoyed, the outcomes that have made a difference will be magnified by the strength of the performance we know we will demonstrate as we learn how to be more inclusive, to know each other's story, and to ensure that we're demonstrating respect in everything that we do. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would add that my goal is to continue to make a difference. I think we all have a role of agitating a bit more and questioning the status quo. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a tagline that says 100% inclusive. We need everyone to advocate for change and true equity and quality for all. Um, it's just not the responsibility of those sort of advocating d and It's every single solitary person in, the in your own social structures and questioning, you know, are those really inclusive? I think about a video that I watched, and it was after Charlottesville, and it was Heather Heyer's mom. Heather Heyer is the young lady that unfortunately lost her life advocating for equality. And her mom, during her eulogy, said, if I'm going to give up my daughter's life for something, then doggone it, we all need to be accountable for driving action. I don't want to lose my daughter, but if I'm going to lose her, I'm glad she was fighting for equality for all. It almost moved me to tears like watching it, and I use that to say she was in that environment talking to an audience that primarily looked like her. And sometimes we need the voice of everyone. 
And I think the more we can realize that we all have a responsibility for inclusion, it's 100%. Yes, we might focus on some groups that have historically been underrepresented. The data would suggest that that's probably a good thing. But if we all don't take responsibility and using our own personal power, I think to advocate for true inclusion and equality for all, we're not giving up our personal best. So that's really my hope, is that we all walk away understanding our own internal power, understanding our own internal responsibility, and that we need all voices to advocate for true inclusion. Because unless we're advocating for homogeneity, which is really the opposite of the conclusion. Because people say, well, tell me the business case again. Well, what, tell, you tell me the business case for homogeneity. <laughs> or what, you know, what's the business case for more women? Well, what's the business case for predominantly men? Like, come on, like these are, let's talk about the real issues here. And the reality is we all have a voice and we need to be using that voice to, draw, to drive for true equality for all. Thank you. I will uh, just wrap up by saying that I think uh, it personally and I think professionally here, the goal of, of DEI efforts really is to normalize it into business as usual at mm -hmm. the budget table mm -hmm. in business as usual, to normalize inclusion so that that difference becomes normal. I think ultimately that's what we're shooting for and we do know that that is actually actually uh, yields uh, superior outcomes. So we are driving toward that, we are pushing that, we don't want it to be marginalized at the doorstep or on the threshold, we want it to be in the hearth mm -hmm. where the cooking is happening, mm -hmm. where people are talking readily, openly, courageously about all kinds of things. That's what the goal is, is to normalize inclusion. Excellent. Karen, I'd be interested in your hopes. You um, have a key role in the Ross School. I would be interested in your hopes my, for this. Honestly, my hope is that I work myself out of a title. Right? <laughs> I, I, I hope that we don't ever have to have a director of diversity and inclusion uh, very in line with what Dilip was saying and, and Cynthia around really taking responsibility that we infuse this uh, really into our all our, our mentality. Um, and it's, it's just a given. It doesn't have to be swimming upstream. Uh, so that's my hope. Work ourselves out of jobs <laughs> to get better ones. <laughs> Thank you. So I have, I have lots of notes. I have really good nuggets from all three of you, so thank you so much. I really hope that you all have also received some nuggets. Uh, inspiration. Uh, <laughs> takeaways that you can take back to your people in your workplace to say, hey, can we try this? Can we talk about this? Uh, how do we talk about this with our managers? If you are our manager, how do we talk about this with our, with our, with our staff? Uh, and that the continuation of the conversation uh, follows us through. So thank you so much. We, are, we haven't left yet, don't leave. We got one more part. We have some amazing special presentations with Diane, Crystal, and Catherine who are gonna make their way out as we transition. Hold on tight, we'll still get you out of here soon. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll stay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Crystal Gregory. I'm with the College of Pharmacy and also a member of the Women of Color Task Force. And on behalf of everyone here today, I would like to thank our amazing keynote panel for truly inspiring all of us to amplify our voices and to move from diversity to inclusion. Karen Petrick, thank you for facilitating such a diverse and spirited panel. Dilip Doss and Loretta Thomas, your insight on diversity within higher education is greatly appreciated. And thank you for all of your work in the Office of the Provost and University Human Resources. And to Cynthia Bowman, thank you for sharing your personal experiences, understanding, awareness, and the perspective of corporate America, and then translating it to, into our higher education world. <laughs> We truly need another word for awesome today because they were so far beyond that this morning. <laughs> My name is Diane Brinson Days from the Ross School of Business. So as a token of our appreciation, we would like to present each of you with a custom-made University of Michigan gift basket from Baskets and More. <laughs> 
Again, thank you to our facilitator, Taryn Petrick, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the Ross School of Business. Thank you to Dilip Das, Assistant Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Loretta Thomas, Associate Vice President for Human Resources. <laughs> and a special thank you to Cynthia Bowman, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Woo! Officer for the Bank of America. Hello everyone, I'm Katherine Weathers, I'm part of LSA Advancement and I'm glad to be here with you. And I stand between you leaving here. <laughs> okay, we have a few announcements. Are you ready? All right. First, please make sure your presence is known and our presence, our presence is known with our social media. The hashtag for the day is WCTF 2019. WCTF 2019. That's for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You all know how to use those, right? <laughs> okay, make that happen. Now, to do something a little different this year, we're gonna do some giveaways which were generously donated by our vendors. The vendors are conveniently located in the Michigan League on the first and second floor. So please make sure you visit the vendors and exhibitors. If you're one of these lucky people, you don't have to run up on stage. <laughs> to collect your prize, go to the registration table over in the league and they will give you your prize or take you to the vendor that donated the prize. Okay, so the first giveaway goes to the first person that registered for this year's conference. Ah, Nicole Burnside. Are you in the room? Nicole Burnside is from the School of Public Health. You were the first person to register for this year's conference. Thank you. Now, the next giveaway goes to, this is our 37th year conference, so it's only fair that it goes to the 37th person, correct? <laughs> that would be, she's from chemical engineering. Her first name is Barbara. <laughs> Last name Perry. Barbara Perry. <laughs> that would be you. <laughs> Now, let's make this a little bit more interesting, and this could get out of hand. You will have to show ID. <laughs> today is March 8th, it's International Women's Day. Whose birthday is today, and you decided to come to the Women of Color Task Force on your birthday? Really? <laughs> no one? Really? Okay, whose birthday is tomorrow? and you will be celebrating it. Really? <laughs> Whose birthday was yesterday and you celebrated yesterday? All righty. Well, thank God. Okay, go over to the registration, tell them my name again is Katherine Weathers because they're gonna be looking for your birthday to be today. Tell them we had to modify, all right? All right. And we still have one left. You ready? All right, eagerly waiting. Okay. Since we're at capacity, you all know we're at capacity, right? Mm-hmm. That's a great thing. We had to cut registration off. We still have people that are waitlisted waiting for us to tell them they can come. No. Um, we didn't do that. Uh, yeah, no, we didn't do that. We had 645 registered attendees. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So 
it's only fair for us to give a gift to the last person to register, right? <laughs> so, from Michigan Madison. First name, Michelle. Last name, Runyon. You were the last person to re Michelle, you're not here. <laughs> she, she was the last person. Somebody, somebody text Michelle. <laughs> Tell Michelle, get dressed, come on. All right. Again, I want to thank you all for registering. We're not dismissed yet. I still have some real announcements, but I thought that was a little bit of fun. Make sure you visit the vendors, okay? Because they brought some great things for you all. All right. Now, for the conference registrants who will spend the rest of their day with professional development enrichment with us, here are your announcements. From now until 11 a.m., you can network and shop with the vendors and just take a moment to digest all of the great information that has been shared this morning. Please know that session A will start promptly at 11 a.m. Please look on your name badge for your session and location. Note, we are at capacity. <laughs> what you signed up for, that's the room you're going to. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time. What you signed up for, that's the room you're going to. We're at capacity, okay, thank you. Page six of your program book, that'll give you that information. Then, lunch will be from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Lunch is a networking lunch. Open seating, there is not a program, so sitting close to the door does not benefit you anyway. Sitting directly in the middle does not be benefit you any way. You can sit wherever you like, but here are the rules when you enter. Because since our numbers are so large, lunch will be on the second floor of the Michigan League in three locations, and the third floor of the Michigan League in three locations, okay? When you enter any of the locations, you are to proceed to the farthest table in the room. Don't walk in the door and sit at the first table. Everybody say that with me, I'm gonna proceed. <laughs> to the farthest table in the room. And you can sit anywhere you want to, just in the farthest table <laughs> in the room. Make sense? All right, so we can expeditiously get in there for lunch. Thank you for your understanding. Now, your lanyards, beautiful colors, right? The yellow lanyard is for the salmon. You will be eating salmon today with me. Yellow lanyard. The pink lanyards, you will be enjoying chicken. I promise it will be cooked, it will not be pink. <laughs> the green lanyards, you will be enjoying a vegetarian lunch. Green veggies, get it? Okay, all right. And after lunch, the workshop, session B, will begin at 2 p.m. Same instructions for session A go to the session you selected, right? Thank you. Now, we know it's Friday, and we know you're gonna say, well, I could cut out a little early. Mm. <laughs> session C is networking, networking, and more networking, with some added fun of line dancing for fitness. That will be beginning in, ball, in the ballroom, and I know some of you are going, I don't know how to line dance. I can't do it. We have an instructor that's going to teach you, and she's really, really good. So we will be in the ballroom beginning at 3.30, and we're going to end the day both mentally and physically energized, okay? Sound good? You with me? All right. Okay, so now I have to go off script. That was on script then. Y'all thought that, right? Okay, I'm taking a point of privilege. I want to bring someone out to the stage who, without her, none of us would be in this room. Janice, can you hear me? <laughs> I want to thank Janice Rubin. So you guys know who Janice is, don't you? Janice is our fearless leader behind the scenes making it happen, making this conference happen year after year. She's the one who keeps the registration open so Michelle could register, because I told her to close it two days prior. 
she won't listen. So we thank Janice for everything that she does and making it happen for us, okay? All right, now it's time. I officially declare the convening of the 37th Annual Women of Color Task Force Career Conference. Let us amplify our voice and move from diversity to inclusion. Change starts now with you right here. Enjoy the day. Thank you.